Support for Lab Out Loud is provided by the National Science Teachers Association. Find out more at nsta.org. Welcome to the Lab Out Loud podcast, science for the classroom and beyond. Today's guest is helping communities and schools by providing tools that help people design and create new things. So we actually see a lot of teachers in science and STEM, they're not teaching a 3D carving curriculum, they're teaching a design curriculum. And so it's it's like we see a lot of success when the class is solving a problem using design. And so the curriculum isn't about a 3D carving curriculum, it's a design curriculum where they're actually going out into the world and solving real problems. That's coming up next on Lab Out Loud, but first I'm your co-host Dale Basler. And I'm Brian Bartell. Today we're continuing to explore uh, an area that's been interesting, Brian and I, and that's the area of desktop fabrication. Listeners will know that we have kind of dabbled a little bit in 3D printing, but we're just starting to dive into the other parts of this manufacturing world, and in this case, uh, carving. So in late 2016, we got a chance to get hands-on with one of the carving tools made by a company called Inventables. And we actually published a, an episode in December titled... Uh, it's on the lookout, desktop fabrication. Yeah, and in that episode, you can hear us uh, opening up the, the the device and getting it ready. You can hear our kids' reactions to it. So if you're listening to this show, you might want to pause this episode and head back to that December show and give it a listen. We also made a video of our experience with the carving machine, so you can actually see it in action. And then when you're done, you can come back and listen to today's discussion, because we are talking to the founder and CEO of Inventables, and that's Zach Kaplan. And Zach actually started Inventables um, right after college, and it was a company that was providing different materials or researching different materials for big companies. And Zach tells us somewhere in 2009, the maker movement started to gain momentum. And slowly, he started to see more and more of inventable customers coming from the maker and DIY side of things. It turns out the idea of being able to carve out materials in your home or your school is exciting for a lot of people, and it's still very exciting for Zach, too. Yeah, what gets me excited about 3D carving is really what you can make. Mm Mm-hmm. Totally. And the materials you can use. You, you can use woods, you can use plastics, you can use metals. Oh, sure. And, you know, you can make furniture, you can make jewelry. The Just the number of things you can make was really exciting. Yeah, just swap um, out a bit and try something new. Exactly. And the so in addition to like the number of things, also the the quality of the items coming off the machine are really store quality. Um where a lot of the, the tabletop 3D printers, they take a long time, and then you're really left with this sort of textured plastic, which is really cool for, for doing like prototypes and form studies. But Yeah. I felt like, after doing 3D printing for a while now, that mm-hmm. when I was done making something using 3D carving, it felt more real. I, I don't know yeah. what that meant, but it just felt like a real thing. As, and I said in the previous show that 3D prints seem alien. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, we love 3D printing and we use it for prototyping a lot. Um, even a lot of the, as we were designing the Carvey, we use 3D printing to prototype different parts of it. Mm-hmm. But yeah, like the resolution you can get to, the, the quality or the realness of the materials, it just feels a little bit more production level. Yeah, and I suppose that's an important point too, is that, you know, it's the right tool for the right job, right? Yeah, like walk into any shop, they don't just have one tool. <laughs> they got a wall full of tools and a bunch of machines and so I think that there's a, a I literally just that. came from a woodworking shop actually with my dad who is, does a lot of woodworking and they they had a different CNC machine there that we checked out and and uh, I got to show my dad the the Carvey in action and he thought what that did was he important. say? He was pretty impressed. He's not I mean the only experience he has with the internet is through the iPad which is probably 80% magic to him. And, okay. um, mm-hmm. and so, you know, what was going on, but I think he was pretty impressed with just, you could see how easel worked and we just put on a happy new year and slapped on some letters and carved it out. And he just, we, we, we you know, I find myself just staring at it, watching it carve and you just kind of like have this moment where it just kind of, I don't know, lulls you for a while as it does it, but. <laughs> he, was, he was really impressed. Uh, he brought some yeah, that's cool. pieces of scratch, and he's made different like things like cutting boards, and um, he's doing a lot of wood turning um, with a lathe that he has, and made bowls and things like that. And so I could see his gears turning 
um, sort of melding. He's done woodworking pretty much all his life. Um, I remember when I was a young kid, he was doing things like that. So um, I could see him thinking of ways that this fit into his world. You know, like it was a kind of a little bit of a way for me and him to connect there too. It was, it was, it was really neat. So cool. Zach, can you tell us a little bit about your clientele or the demographics of your clients? You know, who are they? Are they kids in schools? Are they older people? Who are the makers? Yeah, so it starts with students. We, we think about like, what we're trying to do in Eventables is build accessible community and tools for that whole maker journey. So oftentimes the journey starts with students. And then as folks get older, then we get, um, they're almost like hobbyists where they're doing stuff, but they're doing a little side hustle. And then we also get pro makers where they're running a business using the machine as the engine. Mm-hmm. And so that's sort of the progression that uh, people take. But we also get, at the, at the tail end of that, we do get a lot of folks who were professional designers, engineers, and have since retired, and now um, they're doing this as a retirement business. Is there a prototyping aspect to carving like there is for 3D printing? There is. Um, it's really just what shapes and what uh, materials you want to use to do the prototyping. So you might want to like cut things out in a a cheaper material first and fit things together and see how you're doing and then go to the actual finished material. Is that, is that be an example? Yeah. And also it's just, it's faster to carve something out typically than to print it. Yeah. The speed is really, absolutely. And and that's where I think it's a really a big plus in the education space. Cause um, one of my criticisms of 3d printing, and I don't know if there's a really a way around it is the, you know, we talk about, what 3D printer should go into a classroom and all those kinds of things. And really it's the time cost. That's the biggest thing. And that was one of the most impressive things is the carving goes a lot faster. Yeah. <laughs> we hear that from teachers over and over. Oh my gosh. They're like, and, Oh man. <laughs> and the other thing is like, even the process of carving, like you can start seeing, Oh, that's a letter, you know, <laughs> like it, like it's, it's getting through it right away. And, um, you, you know, that's a, that's a huge, huge plus. Um, the software side of things is a big deal as far as I'm concerned. I didn't have any experience with, um, how, how to get a, you know, how to get the thing carving in the first place. And easel did all the heavy lifting and easel is your, your web-based software to run that runs the, runs the carving tools and also lets you design that. How long has easel been around? Um, easel has been around for about three years. And so we're, we have a team of, uh, software designers and engineers that are working on it every day. Mm-hmm. And w- one of the cool parts about being web-based is as they add new features, everybody gets them instantly. Oh, sure. Yeah, I, I w- one of the first times I, first times I um, used Easel, I was really impressed by the, the little shopping carts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, I, I know it makes sense because you can then s- sell, you know, sell different things, but I also like the fact that I could see what my options are and go and, and, and you pull down a different material. So you're, you're saying you want to carve out a, a picture and you're like, what materials can I use? And you're like, oh, what is this? And you, there's a little shopping cart so you can go price it out and get an idea of what you're looking at. And, and even the bits. And I was like, I've never seen any other <laughs> web-based software do that. And I'm like, that makes total sense. Yeah, it's all for us, it's all about making it more accessible. Choosing a material, choosing a bit, is it can be complicated. You might not know what to pick. And so we're trying to make it easier and easier so anyone can just do it and get started. You don't have to take like a class to learn how to do it. You can focus on the design as opposed to some of these more technical details. Now, this being a a science teacher podcast or science teacher friendly podcast, have you seen any um, works that are created, let's say for a science lab or for a science class, any STEM related things um, that come to mind that you can share with us? Lots of STEM-related things. Um, so it's big with FIRST Robotics. I don't know if you know that. Oh, program. sure. Oh, yeah. Um, and so a lot of the FIRST teams will use both Easel and the X-Carve and Carvey to design parts for their robot. Oh, sure. There's a In Chicago, there's a guy by the name of Jeff Solon who is he teaches Maker Lab at Lane Tech High School. Mm-hmm. And so he's got a whole class where the kids are learning how to do design thinking and um, they actually get to make different projects. So it's, it's been really successful there. I always get stuck in the 
I think this comes, Brian, from our uh, association with always having to tie what we're doing to the curriculum <laughs> as teachers. <laughs> and you're like, how is it related no. to the curriculum? And But I always think about, I'm designing something, I want to make something, and I'm like, okay, yeah, but that's like, you know, I, ma- I made a a bookend. But but it's uh, not really something I you know it's not something I needed you know things like that and I yeah I, I forget to appreciate the the creation side <laughs> you know because oh, that you're because, learning something from just doing that yeah because you're I guess process. I'm running ahead you know you start running ahead and you forget about the process of creating you know an, a piece of art a piece of you know, uh, uh, you know it doesn't have to be a tool it doesn't have to be those kinds of things but I always have like this stuck in my head where I have to like make something that has to be used right away. So we actually see a lot of teachers in science and STEM. They're not teaching a 3d carving curriculum. They're teaching a design curriculum. And so there's one teacher where um, the students designed a garden. And so the students design little um, signs for each of the types of vegetables that they were growing. Oh, sure. Oh, okay. and, and then while they were doing that, they ran into a problem is that there were wasps in the in the garden and so then the students designed a wasp catcher using easel and oh really carved it out and so not only did they have like the wood part of it so in easel there's an app store so they used the box maker app Mm. but they also got a two liter bottle and they filled it up with some solution that attracts the wasps and then they designed a way that the two liter bottle could hook into the box and so Uh, okay and so it's it's like we see a lot of success when the class is solving a problem using design. And so the mm-hmm. curriculum isn't about a 3D carving curriculum. It's a design curriculum where they're actually going out into the world and solving real problems. And that's really, I mean, that's the goal of a lot of our, our new curriculum, especially for science, um, with the NGSS, too, and the engineering principles. So um, do you see any tie-ins with the NGSS? Uh, have you seen something specific? Yeah, lo- lots of teachers are really excited about Carvey and the NGSS um, because the mapping is so clear. Okay. Um, in terms of you know, like being able to check off the boxes and different projects, there. I met with a teacher in California who he's got he's got like an NGSS app on his phone. Yeah. And he was reading. I don't know if you guys have seen that. But, yeah, we've seen him. Um, he was sort of reading down the list of like. Oh yeah. This one. Uh, goes to Carvey and this one goes to Carvey. He's like, this is amazing. Do you have people using easel without a carving machine? Oh yeah. Um, what would that look like? How does that classroom look like then? Well, it's a, it's a, it's a design tool. So you can design um, anything you want. You can also share it. Okay. And a lot of times, like if the school doesn't have one or you don't have one at home, a lot of the libraries now have them mm-hmm. and mm. you can go to the library and carve it out or you could go to a neighboring school and carve it out. Sure. Um, or you could just not carve it out at all and, and just have it be about design. You should have one of those options in easel where you can uh, click to carve and then it would, uh, you know, mail order it for you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, they have that with the 3d, 3D printing, printing and I, and I do see like our library has a 3d printer. Maybe I should go hit them up to get a carvey. Yeah. Click, click to carve. I would click like to a carve, bit of yeah. royalty on that. <laughs> <laughs> Every tenth of a cent I want. No. Um. <laughs> what's the what's your um, age span as far as classroom use? How young have you seen? I mean, I can see this going middle school and high school. That's easy. Um, Brian and I both work in elementary schools too. Have you seen it used in elementary schools? In what capacity? Can you speak to that? Yeah, the youngest that I've seen it is second grade. Um, okay. and that, that's at the lab school at the university of Chicago. So mm-hmm. they've got like second and third graders and they've got a maker lab for them. Okay. That's the youngest I've seen it. Um, a lot going on in junior high and high school mm-hmm. and the university level, like places like Northwestern at the university level and Duke university, university of Illinois are all sort of pretty close to us. And they've got some pretty big programs where they're doing stuff. At the high school level, you're seeing it. Oftentimes, it's, it starts as tied into one of the extracurricular programs, like first. Or yeah. um, we're also seeing it with like uh, uh, Boy Scouts and Cub Scouts when they're making the Pinewood Derby cars. Oh sure. Oh <clears throat> yeah, yeah. I saw some of those um, in the projects at your website too. They had different um, rubber band cars too. Yeah, rubber band cars. Gliders um, was another one I saw. <laughs> yeah. 
And so like the whole, the whole field is like really emerging and it, it's just, I'm, I'm constantly blown away at what different teachers are coming up with and how it ties in the, the class that I was telling you about that did the garden. Those folks were actually in Hawaii and they were middle schoolers. Hmm. So this is an exciting time or terrifying <laughs> as all this is emerging. <laughs> I think it's really exciting. I bet. Uh, I bet yeah. There's gotta be times like, really Oh no. Yeah. I mean, cause like when I went to school, the, the cost of these machines and the complexity of the software was, you know, it, it was hard enough that not that many people got to participate. Yeah. And now, you know, like easel's free and anybody can, can use it for free right now. As Brian said in a, in our previous episode, um, it doesn't have to sit in a tech ed department, for example. It doesn't have to That's be true. limited to certain well, I areas even of a building. See this, I could even see this in the future in like the uh, custodian's uh, shop. You know, and like, oh, we're going to use this to solve a problem or make a part to fix a door or something like that, where it, it might just be a common tool in the future. Yeah, we're actually seeing that at a, a couple of the museums, both at the Children's Museum in Chicago and the Museum of Science and Industry, where... Um, they, to they, make they, exhibits, yeah, they they've changed. So they have they have like a maker lab where you can go. Like at the Children's Museum, they call it the Tinkering Lab, mm. and at the um, at the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago, they call it the Fab Lab. Yeah, but in, in both cases, they've now built these relationships with the maintenance or the exhibit department mm-hmm. because they're sort of using the same tools. Oh, sure. Well, <laughs> and, and that's so you know what Dale was saying too. Instead of making some kind something like out of an alien product uh you're you're using wood you're using metal you're using other things that are uh can be real and and used to fix things right now yeah and so it's it's really like is it's so practical that you're seeing that crossover and i think that that's really opened a lot of people's eyes to what does this mean for the future what does this mean for the economy Mm -hmm. Uh, we're, we're really preparing students for 21st century jobs that some of which don't exist yet Dale mentioned earlier that, you know, like, oh, we, we might expect something like this to come out of Silicon Valley. So how did you end up being in Chicago? Is that a benefit? Is that uh, like, oh, you know, we got to get we got to get in the airport a lot and head back out west or. Um, well, so I grew up in uh, Northbrook, which is a suburb of Chicago. Oh, sure. sure. So I went to the same high school as Ferris Bueller. Oh, yeah. Ferris uh, Bueller, he was like one of the original makers from the 80s. You know? <laughs> yeah, Think well, of the contraptions true. he had His to whole put room, together. yeah, that's right. That's yeah. right. yeah, so I, I got my start with all this stuff at, at that high school. And then I went to the University of Illinois and studied mechanical engineering. And I, I thought a lot about going out to the Valley a couple times, but ended up staying in Chicago. I do go back and forth. We, we have some investors that are in Silicon Valley. Mm-hmm. So... I feel like I've gotten the best of both worlds. <laughs> when you need to go to California, you can go, is what you're saying. Yeah, I mean, it's a four-hour flight, so it's not that big a deal. And that, now they have the internet on the planes. so That's true. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, the, the Midwest is where most of the manufacturing in the United States is. Inside, so, inside basements in the cold winter, is what you're saying. <laughs> well, so that's what's changing. Like, if, if you look at the map of... Um, sort of where factories were and where our customers are. Like, you know, historically factories clustered around the Midwest mm-hmm. servicing like the, um, the automotive industry or uh, there's a lot of medical device. I think businesses. politically they used to call us the, they call us the rust belt, right? Right. And so, if, but if you look at um, the Inventables customers, it's really anywhere where there is population density. It's pretty evenly distributed throughout the United States. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's not just in the Rust Belt or just in Silicon Valley or just in New York. It's it's really all over. And part of it is because Easel is free and you just need to have access to a web, web browser. So it doesn't matter geographically where you're at. Yeah. And the other part is because the machines are inexpensive and they're affordable for folks. Um, you know, and you can get into a, an X car for about a thousand dollars, and the the car is about twenty five hundred bucks. So you're seeing them. Go into people's basements. You're seeing them go into schools. You're seeing them go into libraries, and so there's libraries in every city in the country. Yeah, uh, and so that's pretty exciting. That it's it's no longer a coastal or a geographical thing. It's like who wants to start participating in this stuff? I saw this discussion about manufacturing. A little bit what you're talking about. We're manufacturing. Our, our idea of manufacturing is big factory. Yeah, making a shift to smaller shops that can do more customized local things. Do you think that argument's got some teeth? Oh, absolutely. That's where we see 
the future going. Like, th- there's about 300,000 factories in the United States. Mm-hmm. I think that's going to 3 million. Wow. Based mm-hmm. on just because of the well, access of tools and, and things like this emerging? Exactly. And so, well, and the internet to just basically distribute your idea and, you know, being able to ship it quickly. A lot of that's changed along with alongside of these tools. So the advantage then, what are the advantages of not having your big box factory? You know, because we're, you know, I'm going to take this back to the classroom because we talk about career and college ready all the time and yep. what we're preparing our students for. And, you know, around here, we have big companies and big factories still. And they're saying, you know, this is what, you know, in our neck of the woods, Plexus is asking for, or this is what mm-hmm. so-and-so is asking for. Preparing our kids for the future, w- what's the advantage of a, of a, having a many small as opposed to these big manufacturing companies? And, and I'm sure we're going to have both, but what's the advantage of having these many small ones then? Yeah, so the idea is that you don't have to have inventory and you don't have to guess what inventory you need. So in the old economy or in the last century's economy, if you wanted to make a physical product, you had to prepare the inventory and then guess how many do I send to all the circuit cities, how many do I send to all the Best Buys, etc. Mm-hmm. In this new economy, you know, it doesn't work that way. Like You put out your idea on the internet and you aggregate the demand to you in one place and then you ship it directly to them. Huh. And so... It's I mean obviously Circuit City doesn't even exist anymore. <laughs> I thought it was Circuit funny that you City. picked Circuit City. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so they're they're gone. But right? I want to run a video at Blockbuster. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And so like all of that is changing. The internet I mean, I think Amazon was the number one store where people shopped um this holiday season. For and sure. so they don't have any physical store or no a meaning no meaningful part of their business is from a big box yeah. uh, experience. And so that's where the that's where the economy is going because it, it's more efficient, and so we're starting to see like we saw one of our customers. They're called Studio Neat, and it's two guys. Um, they're in, I think they're in their their twenties or early thirties, but y- younger guys. They've graduated, and they run the business out of one of the guys' house, and so they did a uh, uh, it's a docking station or like a little stand for the new Apple TV remote. Oh, Brian, you so, got one of those. Yes, I do. So, Brian, go on. On the, on the, on the, on the Apple TV remote, as, as a owner of it, what is the number one problem that you have? The number one problem? I'm, I have to hide it all the time, so I, I'm afraid my kids are going to lose it. <laughs> well, most people say that it falls into the couch. Yeah, well, that, like, again, that's part of it. You know, I'm afraid that the kids are going to lose it and it's going to go somewhere where I'm never going to find it, and the couch is one of those places. So these guys at Studio Neat, they, they watched the uh, Apple keynote. And then mm-hmm. that day, they, they looked at all the technical drawings and got the dimensions. And they made a prototype. They made a video. They launched it. They sold, I think it was like about 1000 in the first week. Oh, wow. sure. And, and I think they're like 15 bucks each. They sold 1000 the first week. Obviously, they continue to sell. But like, so they were able to, that's a very niche product. They didn't have to get it out into retail. They were able to get a ton of orders, mm-hmm. and then make to the demand. So they were able to match their inventory outlay exactly to what the demand was. Wow. And in the uh, past, you would have to basically get to a certain amount before you could even talk about manufacturing it. Isn't that correct? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. they'd have to go get quotes from some company to make a prototype. Probably you know, fly to China, things like that. Potentially fly to China. Yeah. Or at least send your drawings to China, have them make it, and then yeah. it would be wrong, and then you have to work about the packaging, all this stuff that like they didn't have to worry about because they didn't have to put it in the store. They they made a really compelling video. They sent it out on the internet, on email, and people put in their credit card. <laughs> so this is a, you know, this is really I like this discussion because it's really about empowering people too. Um we, we talk about all these different tools and you know, honestly, I think education is trying to figure out where makerspace is going to live, where maker, you know, the maker movement is going to live in education and how that'll look. And um, I like conversations about this because I think, I think there's some truth to this idea that you know, manufacturing is completely shifting here, and we we look at where our students are going to be going, and I think often we still turn to. It's because it's natural. It's natural to turn to the companies, the examples that are at our arm's reach, right? Exactly. 
and it's it's hard to you know hard to make these predictions, but I like um, things like Inventables because it's showing us what the potential is. Yeah, and it's happening today. It's it's not something that you have to sort of guess about. You yeah. can see there's examples all over the place. Mm-hmm. You can go on Etsy, you can go on Shopify, and you can see people doing it. We even have middle school and high school classes where they're they've turned the bake sale into a make sale. Oh, yeah. <laughs> And there, we, we we recently did a panel at Burley Elementary School, and one of the uh, teachers in the audience asked the teachers on stage, "How do you pay for the Maker Lab?" And they they said, "We sell stuff." Oh, yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah. That's and awesome. so it's it's getting kids exposed to that part of the process early. So it, it's not this foreign thing like, "Oh, you have to graduate and then go get a degree in business and then go do it." Like you know, it's these sixth graders are bringing in revenue to this class and they're using that to buy more materials and better tools. Well, and the other, the, the sort of the, I guess, old way is that, you know, an employer let you make stuff, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. And, and now you get to, you get to make stuff. Yeah. And it's cool because you also had to go into the lab to access the software, to do your design, whatever it was, where now any computer in the world, you can get on and, and work on your projects so kids are coming to class with the thing already designed. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. And they can spend all the time learning at home. You know, same thing with easily. I mean, you can spend, you don't have to sit by your device, for example. Absolutely. And we've even sent kids that they have like little sketchbooks. So they'll do their design on paper, take a picture of it and then upload it into easel. Hey, yeah, I did. That's, that's, um, I did a little, that's one of, of the things today. you suggested. Yeah. 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 Uh, I just got to get, yeah, a, so. get your contrast, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, Zach, we we thank you so much for your time and and the work you've been doing. Um, it's been great lots conversation. To think about lots to dream about. Yeah, it's an ex- it's an exciting time. Thank you very much. All right, Thanks. thank you guys. For links and other information related to this episode, visit laboutloud.com. You can send us your questions and comments at laboutloud.com/contact. If you enjoyed the show, make sure you've subscribed on iTunes, Google Play Music. Stitcher, or your favorite podcasting platform. And if you really enjoyed it, consider leaving us a rating or a review. Your feedback helps others find our show. Until next time, I'm Dale Basler. And I'm Brian Bartell.